Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Ford again. This today, the topic is going to be on supply and demand. This is kind of central to the core of traditional economics. Uh, it is even applicable to market socialism, where they uh, basically distribute goods via the market structure. Core to the concept of supply and demand, of course, is the concept of price. And we'll most certainly be addressing that uh, directly. The law of demand and the law of supply are relatively straightforward. You most certainly have covered them. And if you haven't read through the book already, then you sh I recommend that you just stop listening to the video at this time. Go back, read the modules, read the book, and then come back to this. But the law of supply and demand are, are straightforward. Law of supply is that all things being equal, that means that um, the quality doesn't change, the demand doesn't change. If you increase supply, you decrease prices. And if you decrease supply, um, you know, you'll increase prices generally. Uh, the law of demand is straightforward too. Um, if demand increases, the price will go up. Um, and if demand declines, you would anticipate the price will go down. And again, notice that price is a, is a core sentence, uh, word in each of these sentences, and a core part of that. Um, basically, market equilibrium, uh, that's the point where the supply equals demand, um, is a place where the consumer, whether it be a producer or end user, basically is willing to pay the price that the supplier is willing to produce it for. Uh, most certainly, if the consumer is not willing to pay that price, well, then some suppliers will probably drop out and you'll see the price drop. Um, and it basically, if demand for it increases, uh, then you'd anticipate that some suppliers who previously were unwilling to supply it for that price uh, would basically enter the market and would reach a new equilibrium, potentially at a higher price. So most certainly, these are the kind of things that are core. Um, price allocates it. And that's what's been really important to understand. Price is an allocation function. Um, if the consumer can efficiently produce goods and services, at a price, they will do so. If a consumer sees that the price is uh, of sufficient uh, low to cover their perceived utility from it, uh, they will purchase it. Those who are unwilling or unable, this is core issues, they have to have resources, have, uh, unable to um, purchase the resources at a given price, will not get the resources. Those resources will go to another supplier possibly somebody who's more efficient in uses, or maybe to another consumer who actually values those goods at a higher level than possibly their original consumer is looking at. And this is, this is critical. This is the allocation. And the uh, efficiency of this is also one other aspect is that um, the transfer of goods and services occurs at the same time as the information as to how much they are valued by consumers and how much suppliers are willing to provide on the simple transaction. You don't have to have any committees meetings or anything like this. Simple transactions occur. Now, the difficulty with this, of course, is that this is a response to existing levels of income distribution. So the efficiency being talked about here is efficiency of just transfer are the efficiency of production. Most certainly, if suppliers cannot produce something at a given price and others can, well, then you have an efficiency aspect. Less efficient producers will drop out. And if consumers don't value it as highly as reflected by the dollars they're willing to spend, then those consumers basically drop out of the market too. But that is all dependent upon the distribution of income. Somebody may want food very badly, but if they don't have sufficient income to purchase it, they cannot create demand for it. And price will mean they are not allocated the food, even the children are going hungry. So most certainly you can take a look at it from that perspective. And of course, it's also a relatively brutal system in terms of those who may have been producing something, but somebody comes up with a new way of producing something, all of a sudden the family firm no longer can compete and they are forced out 
by lower cost competition, whether it is domestic or international. Now there are some major considerations that we will be dealing with both in this course generally and from the Commonwealth's book. One I already mentioned, this is only efficient if the wealth and income distribution are acceptable. You change the income distribution and everything changes. It is no longer efficient. It is just a, well, a way of distributing things. Two, in a society with large numbers of resources, could efficiency be the normative goal, the goal in terms of what we want out of the system? <clears throat> Maybe fairness, quality of life, something like this should be more consideration, more consideration. Efficiency itself means nothing. We now currently efficiently allocate billions of dollars to a few families just because they have the wealth and therefore they can spend it on all kinds of stuff. Is it efficient to basically be for expensive yachts and things like this when other people are going hungry? Again, this becomes a normative thing, a value-laden thing. If we accept the distribution of wealth as a given, like economists like to do, well, you're also accepting the status quo, which is a value decision, whether economists like to recognize it or not. Okay, um, can you be efficient also if you don't have certain public resources and public investments? Most certainly capitalism doesn't do a very good job of addressing this. Recently, growth in the United States has suffered because we have underinvested in infrastructure, we've underinvested in research, and we've underinvested in education, and we've underinvested in healthcare. Even though we spend lots of money in terms of real allocation of resources of right people, we've underinvested in those areas. So again, the questions raised are: Is this traditional role of price and supply and demand? work that well if you really consider the real world and not just some textbook or as uh, Dr. Connell likes to refer, blackboard type of description of economics. And consider the reality. The average man, woman, and child in America makes over $65,000 a year in income. But the average family, median family, makes far less than that. That means the allocation of resources is predominantly going to a very small segment. And at this time, the top 1%, for example, earns almost 27% of all income. The top 1% earns, and I put earns in quotes, in the neighborhood of six, uh, five and a half trillion dollars. Is this efficiency? And these are questions we will raise. Thank you very much. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.